and we'll hand over to Chris and Kathy uh, and say thank you to both for, for generously giving their time uh, today. And Kathy, Chris, over to you. Thanks, Michael. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, Kathy and I have agreed to do a double act. Um, so I'm Chris Sanguin, I'm from University of Edinburgh. Kathy, perhaps we should introduce ourselves before we start the talk in earnest. Yes, yeah, so I'm Kathy Smith. I'm from the Open University. And I suppose my specialism is largely in maths education and that's that's my teaching responsibilities as well and my kind of academic history. Whereas Chris might position himself more in mathematics. So between right. us, we make a good pairing. Yeah. Um, we're also together um, two editors of um, the journal that we're going to speak about, along with Duncan Lawson, who many of you will know as well, who's delegated us to do this. Thanks, Cathy. So, yeah, I'm uh, in the Maths Department at the University of Edinburgh. I've spent the majority of my career in mathematics departments, but I've always had an interest in uh, professional interest in mathematics education at HE level. Um, so let's make a start. We've, we've put collected our thoughts together and then we will leave plenty of time for questions at the end. And we're expecting a, a, a proper discussion session at the end of this. So let's start off um, with writing. I think as academics, our job is to write. We are professional writers and we need to publish. And certainly in TMAT, we get a lot of papers that are an interesting, really just an interesting piece of mathematics. Um, so that might be because you're interested in it or you are writing an expository paper about a topic. Um, I have to say, I write quite a lot of papers of this kind, and I find it very useful for clarifying my thoughts. Uh, my PhD student and I wrote a paper about proof by induction for school teachers. And George Kinnear, a colleague in Edinburgh, he and I wrote a paper about the, proof, the difference between proof by contradiction and a contrapositive. So, you know, the, collecting your thoughts on subjects is something that we all can do, and I very much appreciate being able to do it. Um, and there are plenty of venues for publishing this kind of uh, writing. So in particular, Mathematical Gazette, um, that encourages features and expositions. And the Scottish Maths Council is a journal uh, targeted at school teachers. So... Um, they have all sorts of articles, and I quite often write articles for that. But these papers um, typically don't constitute educational research, and we want to explain a little bit about that here. So it's unlikely that an interesting piece of mathematics or an expository paper would be accepted by TMAT as educational research. Um, I mean, both of these two journals here um, have peer review processes. There's nothing pejorative about saying we won't, or we're very unlikely to accept it. It's just um, important to choose the right journal for the right for the type of work you're writing about, um, and do that at an early stage. Uh, okay, next slide. So this, these are other things you might want to write. You might want to write personal reflections of teaching. You might have got years of experience and want to write about your approach to teaching something. That's still not research as such. You might want to write, that might give you a position or an opinion that you want to put across at the result, as a result of scholarship, um, where you, you think about the right way to teach something or the right way to approach something. Now, here are some um, journals where the scope of the journal, if you go on their website, you go to the publisher's website and you click down the bit that says about this journal, it will nearly always give you um, a sentence or two about the scope of the journal. And that's where you want to be looking for, is this the right journal for me? Um, Mathematics Today is an IMA publication and it does have general interest publications for mathematics graduates, including articles about maths education. It is at least editorially reviewed, um, not peer reviewed, really. Um, MSOR Connections is a great paper for publishing um, innovative accounts of innovative learning. So um, I've got I've got permission here to mention one of my colleagues' papers um, entitled. Can the same statistics module be used for service teaching 
by tailoring the support based on the student's chosen qualification. So basically online learning, but the computer scientists are doing a different set of strands than the economists, whatever. Two years of data. Um, it's it's very much um, interested in, in supporting students, but it's not a research question as such, um, because it doesn't speak to the wider um, education knowledge base. And, and that that fitted, that was perfectly published um, in MSOR Connections. Um, so accounts of, these are really interesting things for the field. How did somebody else do this? How did they evaluate it? What are the current ideas that might lead you to develop um, a, an innovative project of your own? So MSOR Connections certainly published in there. Um, and teaching statistics, if you're on, more on the statistics end, it's published by the Teaching Statistics Trust, um, and it's got um, it's got articles by teachers, but it's articles in higher education as well. It's very much about what makes statistics different from mathematics, um, and so as you see there, distinct discipline. So that's another place to go and have a look at. Would your paper fit in that journal? Um, out of those three today, the three that I've got there, teaching statistics is a bit closer to the journal that Chris and I edit than any of the others, I suppose. Right, so moving on to that, um, this is the journal that we edit, um, which is teaching mathematics and its applications, which we often call TMAT because it's T-E-A-M-A-T, -E -A -A teaching mathematics. It's a journal of the IMA. And where I said this magic about place, this about is the tag you want to be looking at in almost all um, the journal websites. So that, and if you click through on that, it will give you the scope of the journal. I have made it somewhat larger on the next slide. So you're looking for a statement that says something like this. Um, I'll just leave my people a moment to read that. Okay. Um, out of those three sentences, for most people, the first and the last are the most important sentence there. So the last sentence is about the journal's readership and it's signaling that this is a wide readership and therefore we're interested in papers that explain themselves well to a variety of people, including international readers. You'll find a similar statement on many journals' websites, um, which is about explaining your terms, making sure that you're not only addressing an, an Anglo-centric or um, you know, Scottish-centric or Irish-centric context. Think about the international reader as well. Think about people who aren't entirely versed in the jargon of your educational context. Um, we at the Open University are nightmares for talking in terms of jargon. Um, and so, you know, but everybody will have their own. The first sentence is really important as well. Um, the scope is set as being papers that contribute to the improvement of mathematics teaching and learning for students from upper secondary high school level through to university first degree level. If the paper does not address how teaching and learning could be improved at that appropriate level, it is not in scope for the journal. Um, and so every journal has its own has its, has its own statement like that. And you want to be looking at that, not only to decide whether you are going to submit to that journal, but also when you write your paper, your paper should be arguing that it makes a contribution in that way. So that's an interesting thing there. Um, we said we'd mention another journal that is kind of around the same area as teaching maths and its applications is IJMES, the International Journal of, oh, I'm going to forget it, Mathematics and Education. Is there science and technology? I think I'm, and maybe it's engineering, science and technology. I've used the acronym so often, but Chris will no doubt help out. 
And there, because it's got technology in, and if you read its its statement, it is interested in articles that are within mathematics education, but which definitely have an application to technology. And so this is Talmo. If you're thinking of um, publishing about working online, um, that might be a relevant journal as well. And we have this second sentence because of our history that there has been a lot of interest in um, applying mathematics to the real world and applications of mathematics and mathematics modeling. So we have a history of publishing papers about mathematics modeling. And if you're going to publish, you might look to contribute to that strand of knowledge that has been developed over time in TMAT and um, because it situates your paper in the right literature. So that's really talking about the importance of these scope statements about the journal. Um, and I'm just going to say a little bit more about what we are looking for in teaching maths and its applications um, that would be similar for other journals that are mathematics education research journals. Um, so one thing is there is a plethora of journals about math science education and research. There are serious education first journals, education studies in mathematics, mathematics teaching and learning. Um, there are um, research in mathematics education. So I could name four or five, six, seven, eight journals that um, are serious journals in the social sciences field where mathematics is the subject of interest but the methodology and the approach is a social science approach, which values social science theory. Teaching mathematics and its applications is slightly different from that. And um, I would say somebody, when I was asked to take it on as an editor, it was described to me as a theory light journal, um, spelt theory light, L-I-T-E. Um, and that is because our readers who we think of as people very much like you, are not interested in complex educational theory. They're not interested in pitting theories against each other and the subtle nuances of post-structuralism versus post-modernism. Um, they're interested in, going back to exactly what we said before, um, research articles that contribute to the improvement of teaching and learning mathematics at the required level. And I keep that phrase because it is, every time I read a paper, I think, does this contribute? Does it fit our aim? Um, we welcome papers, therefore, from people who are lecturers, who are teachers in sixth forms, um, teachers in schools, but lecturers in HE who are interested in researching within their own practice or within a group of colleagues' practice. Um, and that is our that's our bread and butter. And we you know very interested in supporting people to publish um, research in our paper. Um, I think Chris has all Medi mentioned the idea that what we don't accept, and yeah, an interesting bit of maths, or sometimes we get papers that just say, we think it should be like this, but we don't have access to classrooms, so we haven't been able to test it. Well, we're just not going to publish that. So ideas about how other people should teach, they don't get published. And you can see why, because you as a reader don't want to read speculative and untrialed research articles. Um, and roughly the length of papers that we engage in is up to 10,000 words, a bit shorter for what we call section B articles, which is what we're about to go on and explain. So the journal has uh, informally has two sections, section A and section B. And section A, most of our papers are submitted to section A. And section A are uh, standard research articles. So we would be looking for an experimental investigation, um, something which has some research in it. And I've selected two papers just to talk about here. Um, so the first paper is by Ellie Darlington. Thanks, Kathy. Um, and what Ellie does in this paper is looks at the difference between A-level mathematics, further mathematics and undergraduate examinations. Um, so this is absolutely on that uh, upper secondary university boundary. So it's absolutely in scope in that sense. And what she does in this paper is um, develops a taxonomy of mathematical tasks and then applies that taxonomy to, uh, to exam papers. 
So she's got a corpus of exam papers and then she applies this methodology to that corpus. So there's definitely a research component is ob objectively some methodology, some results and some discussion. So I think this is a, if you're looking for an example of a, um, the sort of paper that we would like to encourage, I think this is a very good example of that. Um, and this paper has been widely cited. Um, she's not the first person to develop taxonomies of tasks. There are at least two others that I could name, uh, and that's without getting me even far as back as Bloom's taxonomy, which is a much more general taxonomy. Um, this paper also uh, is interesting because it's it's undertaking educational research without any students involved. So it's entirely a desk-based analysis. Um, it wasn't looking at students' achievement. It wasn't asking students what they think. Um, and so as a way of getting started in educational research, the requirements for ethics and so on are much, much less with a paper of this type. Um, you're fully in control of the materials. You're not asking for volunteers to take part in a study or you don't need to get ethics clearance to, to undertake undertake that work. So that was the reason for pulling out for pulling out this paper. Um, and it has, I think, rightly been um, highly cited and quite influential. And that methodology has been used later. The second paper um, is, again, section A paper. Now, I, I mean, I, I agree with Cathy, we're joint editors, we are a theory light journal, um, but, but theory really does matter. Um, it does matter that when we, we talk about what does learning mean and how do we recognize it, there is some, some theory, there is some theory, there is some stated way of determining whether or not somebody has learned. Um, and so I pulled this paper out because it is working with students but it's also linking into an existing psychological theory. So you know, cognitive bias of loss aversion is a very well-established psychological principle. And so when we talk about theory light, we don't mean um, theory absent, but we're not developing theory. And as Kathy, just to reiterate what Kathy said, we're not looking for subtle differences between theories. But it does strengthen a paper if you look at existing psychological theories and apply those to mathematics education in a way that strengthens your paper. Or uh, sociological theories. Not sorry, not. yes, yeah, but yeah, psychological and social, thank you. Psychological and sociological theories, well-established educational theories, theories from those sorts of disciplines. Uh, and I think that really strengthens um, strengthens the quality of the work and allows other people to make judgments about how you've gone about it and why you've made certain choices. So I think that that is important. Uh, and that's why I've chosen this paper as a section A example, because it does make reference to, a, to an established, um, some established theory. Okay. So on to section B, I think, yeah. So section B, these slightly shorter articles, um, they are, they're, um, I'll give you, the, they're envisaged as you've done a great innovation, you made a great change in your teaching, um, you've talked about it with other people, you've evaluated it, it really worked and you think the wider world needs to know about it, but you haven't set it up from the beginning as a research project. That's one of the ways I think about it. It's not a research question. You didn't design your research instruments um, based on the principles that you, you started with, but you have collected a fair amount of information about something that has happened. So we've got articles based on scholarly argument, informed by knowledge of research, um, which might be innovative approaches to teaching and a justification for considering their wider use. So these are these are the section B articles. All of those elements need to be in there. Scholarly argument informed by research, justification for wider use. Um, and my my example of those, of this one is actually a paper by Leander Kempen in Germany, um, which has been well cited, actually. Um, somebody with two years worth of trial. And this is written not as this is what I did, um, make the best of it you can. It's very carefully written as a series of decisions that other people might take, almost a map. He says some kind of manual instruction. 
um, a map of questions and decisions that you might think about if you if that one might think about if one was going to try the trial the same thing in in their own practice with lessons learned and evaluation built some form of evaluation built in so that somebody else who is trialing this could benefit from Leander's research argument and experience and tr and evaluated experience and give themselves a help up on the way. Now, I, I've chosen that as a couple of us have agreed that that's a nice section B article. And also it is very clearly not a research article. So if you want to look up at um, that, that, that difference, it, it makes a difference quite nicely. Um, it also very clearly does not overclaim. It doesn't it doesn't make wide generalizations. It is very clear about what it, how it was successful, how it wasn't successful, and how limited its data is. And that is important. Right, I think um, back to you, Christian. Yes, just to reiterate what Kathy say, said about Section B papers. Um, and, and to... Well, to endorse what Kathy said about Section B papers, but just to say that we publish fewer Section B papers than Section A papers, because although they're shorter, I think it's harder to write a Section B paper for TMAT, because it's easy to fall into either an opinion piece or just writing about the maths. So for that reason, we tend to um, not, Section B papers can be more difficult to write, I think. Um, so, yeah. So this brings on to, you know, if you're thinking about publishing and wanted some practical advice about scholarship in a teaching project and you're intending to publish it, then please start early in your planning. Um, it's much more likely to be successful if before you've done any teaching or even before you've designed the teaching, you think about what you're going to try and investigate. Now, that could be... Um, embedding some research about a particular aspect into that or it could be that you would like to write a section b paper and that you would like to report your experiences uh, either way um, deciding what which which route you're going to take early is much more likely to be successful and in particular um, we do expect all papers to have ethical clearance and participation consent um, that's standard practice in educational research. I think that is a big and positive change in the field. Certainly when I started in educational research in 2000, um, it was, um, I, I, what, what do I want to say? Ethics is now uh, expected and required. It was possible to publish papers where formal ethics consent hadn't been obtained. And I think the field is better because for those people not familiar with ethics, ethics is about planning studies, about respecting anonymity, about respecting your participants' time, about making sure that if it's in a teaching situation, they're being educated and are not just guinea pigs and so on and so on. And I think the whole thing has led to better research. And so the whole ethics process is really about ensuring the quality of research, uh, as well as about treating participants fairly. So please, if you've not done that before, uh, think about it right at the beginning. It's not, it is daunting the first time you do it, but it's not necessarily complicated, especially if all participants consent freely and are anonymous and so on. The barriers for obtaining ethics clearance are often very low in those situations. So if you're not familiar, each, each institution will have its own set of policies about ethics. And some institutions have um, ethical checklists and um, if you work diligently through the checklist, you may find that you can self-certify and you don't need your study to be approved by an ethics committee. Uh, ethics committees reserve their consideration for studies where there may be harm to participants or uh, where you can't guarantee anonymity and so on and so on. Right. So it may be very straightforward to get ethics and having gone through the process um, that that will strengthen your result. So. The last thing I'd like to say is start with a genuine question. Um, and the last point is on the opposite side of that is to avoid just gathering data and looking for patterns. Again, it, it, this comes back to the role of theory. Um, if you have a theory like cognitive load theory, if you base your uh, research questions on a theory like cognitive load theory, you're much more likely to ask a meaningful question 
gather data that answers that question and then be in a position to discuss that data rather than just looking for correlations or other other uh, observations in in students engagement or answers or so on okay um yes um right so i, I yes just to read <laughs> Please, please do base the work in theory, have a clear hypothesis and say what you mean. What does success mean? How do you know if somebody's learned? Um, there might be different ways to answer that. You know, if, if, you're, if learning means fluency in a particular task, that might be quite different from confidence in problem solving. So please state what you mean and then justify why the data that you've gathered uh, does actually contribute to our understanding of what you say you mean. Um, and these things, you know, defining learning is notoriously difficult, and we, we understand that, and it will mean different things in different situations. Um, and, and I think sometimes, yeah. sometimes that's a difficulty from coming from a kind of mathematics point of view. It's not that there is a right answer to what is learning in this case. It's that there are plural answers, and for the reader to follow your argument and know that it makes sense, you need to have explained what it is that you consider to be a successful outcome or a significant um a significant change in this context and therefore that means that we get papers that talk about specifics rather than blandly talking about students were happier um and they scored better in a test at the end of it where we don't know what the test was about so that's you know that that business about being asked to define your terms um and state those very clear to other people is important um, Chris has mentioned cognitive load theory quite a lot. So he's on the psychological side. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring out <laughs> yeah. So something like if you were thinking about online learning, Garrison's community of inquiry model, which talks about the social presence, the cognitive presence, and the teaching presence um, within a an online pedagogic setting would be another model. But equally, you know, it the theory helps you make a clear argument. That's the purpose of the theory. It's not theory for the purpose of throwing in some theory. It's because theory is what justifies your argument and makes it understandable to other people. Um, so, you know, it's let's say it's not jargon. It's it's logic we want here, and logic is based on on established theories or even new theories, providing they're very well explained. Right, I interrupted. Sorry, Chris. There we go. Thanks, Kathy. No, that's very helpful. Um, one other thing um, before we get on to discussion, which we haven't put in the slide, um, I have a personal, there's a bugbear when you're looking, reading educational research papers that involve questionnaires or research instruments involving tasks. Um, I have a strong preference for papers where the tasks are published as an appendix and where there's real clarity and where in principle the study could be replicated. Uh, it's not always possible to publish those kinds of instruments, particularly if you want to reuse them and you don't want those materials to, to be publicly available on the internet. Everything's available on the internet now. So I understand that's not always possible, but I, I please give careful thought to uh, how you could make it possible for other colleagues to replicate your work, because that is the basis of science. OK, uh, so on to discussion. Um, some obvious, obvious uh, points, really. I mean, are you actually filling a gap? Um, so please look at what else has been done um, and consider generalizing your findings. I, 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 we have talked about not overgeneralizing, but please make, uh, you know, uh, well, yeah. And that just brings on to the last point. Why would a reader be interested in what you're doing? So part of generalizing your findings is part of explaining why this the journal's readers would be interested. Um, Kathy, do you have anything else to add to that? I, th I think one of the main things that our referees say and that I say back to authors is I don't think it is clear what new knowledge you have you are claiming in this paper. And I don't know how the new knowledge you're claiming improves mathematics and teaching and learning for other students apart from the ones that you trialed it on. So it's that. That's that idea of generalizing. In, in what way does it help anybody else to read this paper? What are you, what are you, what is the message you are getting across? What's the argument behind it? And how can it approve, improve wider teaching and learning? It's very difficult to do 
but that is where say plan towards your discussion think about how you are going to what is your contribution we said this are you actually filling a gap but what is your contribution to other people's knowledge because that's what research is is trying to have a contribution to other people's knowledge, not just improve what has happening, what has happened or is happening in your teaching. Um, so that, you know, there will be a discussion section of your paper. Be thinking about what goes in that discussion section. That is the case. That's the place for making your case about why other people should pay attention to what you found out. We, we, we we presented this, we thought about having a talk here in which we raised some of the main points that we think are really important to keep in mind when you're um, when you're working towards publication. But we also thought that might just jog your mind about the questions that you want to ask. So we want to stop talking now. Um, and we're hoping that having taken you on a quick route of um, writing for publication that you will now think of things that you'd like to find out about and ask us about. So I think that means that Michael oh, and Kevin are going to chair some questions for us. Yeah, hello. I, I, I don't know if we, we decided. But anyway, a quick round of applause there. People can show their reactions in the reactions uh, um, icon, I suppose. <laughs> Michael's appeared to uh, clapping. So you can do claps and thumbs ups and hearts and things um okay yes so if, if people got any questions they can stick them in the the q a um uh thing is it um you'll find that down the bottom of the screen there should be something saying q a click on that type it in um i suppose you can you, you know um we need to give a few few moments for people to put things in there otherwise uh I should have thought up a good question. Yeah. What, 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 what were we supposed to be asking questions about there? You've taken this oh, sorry, from me. Question. It's VJ. Oh, we got one. Hi, my name's VJ. T. Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, you, you've, you've, you, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you put, you put the, uh, the, the, the mic on. Okay. Hi. I'm sorry, is that all right? Yeah. yeah. Go okay. on then. Other people can put the stuff in the Q and A while we're, while we're talking. Um. So, so sometimes. I do some research or there's bits of my teaching that really interest me and I think about how I could improve that. Um, I wouldn't say I'm heavily involved in theoretical research, given everything, and I was just looking at how you talk about backing up your methods or what you believe by some theory or something that would help other academics. Um, how What would be a best way to develop my knowledge in all the theories or theories that I find important to what I'm doing? Are there particular journals I could go to or areas? Um, I know discussions with academics help, but, you know, given how busy we are and everything else that's going on. So one of, so one of the things I'm interested in research, but, you know, um, getting familiar with theories that are out there. I, I didn't know about Holes one for online learning, for example, that's new to me. Um, sorry, Kathy, go ahead. You go first. Yeah, I'll go first, and then I'll, I'll be. So I would say um, I wouldn't start by kind of trying to get familiar with every theory. That's just not practical. You're mathematicians first and foremost, so that that's not where you want to start. But I would start by thinking, right, if I'm particularly interested in online learning. Um, or I'm particularly interested in flipped learning, something like that, then um, I would actually start with a literature search in your library um, on a term like that. And I would find papers in TMAT, in IDMEST, and in um, MSL Connections, for example, that are close to the, the feature of pedagogy that I am interested in. And I would read where they base their work. So you, you are trying to contribute to an ongoing conversation that is held in research journals. So you want to start with where that conversation has left off and you want to be talking in terms that is recognisable in that conversation. So I would go to that conversation. I know Jenny Golding's in the room here. Um, I would read, if I was thinking about online learning, I would read Jenny's article, which uses the Garrison COI model. And I would think, does that model make sense to me? Is that a theory that I can talk in terms of? Um, and that 
So the, so that's how I would do it, is I would find the papers that address the area I'm interested in, and I would see what theory they are using. And if there's a choice, I would think which one makes most sense to me. Yeah. What you don't need in TMAT is you don't need a whole section that says, I chose this theory rather than that theory. That's what we mean by theory light. You need to say, I'm thinking in terms of this approach, this theory, I'll write it in this way. That's my answer. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different tack and step back a little bit just to suggest that it's helpful to think about what your overall success criteria are for your, your personal goals as a, as a colleague. So that... TMAT's in an interesting position because I wouldn't describe it as um, for those people who whose success will be judged on REF and research excellence in education, TMAT would probably be not be their first choice journal. Um, it, on the other hand, um, if you want to clarify your own thoughts, as I often do on a particular piece of mathematics, I wouldn't publish in TMAT either, right? I mean, that, that's just not the right place either. So it's important to think about what your, your personal goals are and your personal success criteria. Because whenever you sit down to write, it's going to take time and work. And it's probably you probably need to be successful in what you do. I think we all need to be successful. I mean, I hope that's not, you know, I hope that's that is true. I think that's true. Um, so to give you a practical example of what I mean by this decision-making process, my, my former PhD student, who's just recently graduated, she's done a, a very interesting thesis. She wanted to use proof by mathematical induction as a vehicle to undertake some research in online learning. And so just to get the mathematical induction out of the way, we sat down and wrote a review of mathematical induction, what it is, its history of the subject, things that can be proved by mathematical induction, different forms of induction. We did a review of all the um, previous educational research that had been done on the difficulties students have with mathematical induction. And we did that as a review article just to get it out of the way so that she could then focus on her actual research study without having any of this background stuff. And so that ended up right, involving two quite different papers. One went to the Scottish Maths Council Journal, uh, and we wrote that for school teachers. Uh, and the appendix had every induction question that had been on a Scottish advanced hire in the last 20 years as a helpful appendix, uh, for which I think the uh, examiners won't thank me uh, because uh, <laughs> uh, they won't have anything left to ask. Um, and then that just freed her up to write a research paper that was very focused on the particular questions about online assessment that was the core of her thesis. So I think um, the advice that John Blake was my first head of department in Birmingham will be known to many people on this call. And the advice he gave me was make sure everything you do, you, you get the maximum value out of it. That's not double publishing or salami slicing, but it's just trying trying to really think carefully about the success and making sure that what we spend our time doing is successful. So I think that is related to your answer. Um, if your success criteria involve educational research, then you're going to get much more into the theory. If you're much more practitioner focused, then it might be tied much more directly to the particular teaching you're doing. And I think a lot of the decisions, um, the answer to your questions will follow from, from that. Thank you. That's really helpful. That's given me some direction. And, and also then in, in terms of more specific things, um, there are seminar series. Um, a lot of university departments typically have seminar series. We have a series of seminars in Edinburgh and no other department on mass education. Other departments uh, have series of mass education. And these are increasingly online now. So, you know, you're welcome to join those seminar series and listen to speakers and ask them about their design and why they did it. Uh, engage in uh, that's a perhaps a more personal way of engaging rather than just reading lots of research papers and you can ask the questions about where the gaps might be and I was thinking of doing this has it been done already and and start to build up professional networks of people that can offer you informal advice if you need informal advice on on how to go about things and where to get started and relevant literature because it is difficult to get started right that's the purpose of this this uh, this session yeah 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Right. Yeah, guys, it's a great question. And a good point from Chris there. I mean, if people are running online seminars, um, it'd be great if other people could could, could join in. Um, I mean, does, do people want to put in the chat maybe or send us some information about um, seminars that can be joined? Because I'm not aware of anyone um, put, putting their seminars online. Um, I've not been going to any. So if, if anybody's got any we can perhaps put 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 them uh, somewhere where you can find them on the uh, the resources page. Um, okay, uh, thanks for that question. Um, should we I go? Put, to... I put a link. I put just a note in the chat. I mean, it was just the first, what the classic text that you your your library might have, um, which is research methods in education. Um, that that's a classic tome that looks a bit like that, with lots of paper. But you know, it's it's still a good. A good one. If anybody else has ideas, they could put them in the chat as well. Right. Reference books. Okay, we, we we do have a question in the a couple of questions in the Q and A. One one I was expecting a question on ethics, so maybe you can uh, maybe somebody can answer this one about the ethics requirements. <clears throat> if you want to write a paper about having introduced an innovative uh, teaching method in lecture course um, lectures course, it's a bit unclear to me how to do ethics that involves participants' consent because it's in the past. Also, even if you even if done ahead of time with a class size of, say, 300, how would you be able to manage some students consenting and others not? Uh, and that's from Julia. So has anybody got any thoughts on that? Shall I? This this is this all depends on it's to some extent, it depends on your institution. Um, and it, it's about where your work changes from having been your normal educational practice to being research. Um, so your normal educational practice, you don't need consent to innovate in your normal educational practice. Um, so if in that case, what I would do is I would go to the person in my ethics department and I'd say, I now want to write up my educational practice um, for a research paper. I have got or and I want to get more, perhaps, data from my students about, about the outcomes of that. So it might be that I want to use written work they've already produced, but I'm now using it for a research purpose. It might be that I want to interview them. It might be that I want to design a new test, something like that. Um, and where what I do normally crosses over into something that I am doing for a research purpose, that's when I need to start thinking about the ethics of it. So at that point, you know, I know the Open University actually has some ethics procedures about contacting students involving them in research. Other universities will have might draw the line in slightly different places about what you need. Um, but if you want to quote students verbatim, you will probably want to have a uh, informed consent from them so that you can put a transcript of their answer to a mass question within your research. You know, you can publish it so that you can talk about why that mass question is the way it is. If you're aggregating all their work and only publishing marks um it would not be maybe so necessary so it depends on what you want to depends on what you want to publish um but the point is your ethics committee there is is there to run through a checklist with you and give you the advice about what you need um you are always balancing the value of your research against the harm done to participants in the time you are taking up their time and using them as guinea pigs slightly so it's always a balance and you just have to think through those things. Um, what it in practice, um, what it tends to mean in terms of um, aggregation, um, and if a student doesn't give consent, well, we can't go backwards in time and not stop them having the innovative treatment, but it does mean you wouldn't be able to cite their work in your, in you know, quote, quote their work in your journal, um, in your paper, and depending on how aggregated and how reasonable it would be, it might be that you would need to go through and eliminate their data. But again, it's a question of discussing the harm it might do to have somebody's, I got 35% included in a massive statistics on 300 people, um, you know, whether it would damage your results to take that out. Um, it is a question of balance, and that's why you go to an ethics procedure and you you discuss that and you propose what you think, and the ethics committee will come back to you and generally say, if you've thought it through carefully, 
they would probably say it's fine. Anything else I want to say there? There's always a time. You always say you've got the chance to withdraw up until this time. And after that, sorry, it's published. Yeah. So sorry, just quick question. Uh, do you think passive consent is enough? Generally, for um, for human research, it, you, you need opt-in consent. Um, mm. I think, but you might you might argue that with three hundred students, all of whom have gone away, you know, left the university, and you're going to write that passive consent is enough. So generally, you know that your university will have particular rules and it is about it is about feasibility if you are trying to publish paper from two years ago which is in aggregate anonymized form um you're not going to be able to get opt-in consent from every single one of those people who's left your university you'd need to make the case to your ethics committee well i think i think with the data that is in the past is it's nearly impossible to get any serious the the ethics committee agree to it too much because they state very clearly that ethics has to be done beforehand the question is whether for some of them uh, it really needs ethics because uh it was done as part of teaching so it's just a report about what happened mm. but um so of course for individual quotes or individual submissions it would be easy to just contact the students they're still there it's not that that would be easy it's more about uh, questionnaires that um, I send, for example, asking them um, about issues that came up in group work. So where this could be just summarized anonymously um, and it's part of multiple choice. So it's not just marks, but it would be, you know, what what was difficult to do, you know, and then examples like meeting, finding a meeting time. Um you know, um, disagreements about who does what, that sort of thing, and whether you could publish uh, just uh, percentages about, you know, 50% of students found this and this thing difficult when doing group work, um, whether that is something that already needs uh, needs to be um, through ethics. So it's not about individual, um, revealing individual opinions, it's more about whether they are actually agreeing to, to participate, to, to have that part of an aggregated report. So can I can I come in here? Yeah, yeah. Chris, can, yeah. You, can you answer it quickly? Because I would like to get one more question okay. in. The, the absolutely right. cleanest situation is where you have a hypothesis, you divide it, design an instrument to investigate that, some task in a workshop. And of course, then everyone is, has informed consent right at the outset. You might choose to do that task with everybody. A subset of those who consent will be included in your study. Now, if you're not in that situation, you've got data, then you can often go back to the ethics committee in your institution and make a case for why the value of this data outweighs the importance of getting consent. There is mm. a reason why we couldn't get consent, and that's up to the ethics committee to decide. And you are then covered as a professional. I wasn't sure about this. Normally, we would get consent, but actually, in this case, the institution has agreed that we're going to waive consent and that we're going to um, we're just going to determine that the, the outcome is important enough. Um, and there are all sorts of other situations where you may not give informed consent. It's impossible to do studies on honesty if you tell people you're doing studies about honesty. So you cannot have informed consent there. And so you go to the ethics committee and say deception is absolutely necessary. Um, I know of one colleague who's inflicted pain on people because they're investigating the effect of pain on cognition. Well, fair enough. Right. So that all needs ethical approval. So the simplest situation is certainly in my institution, we have a checklist. And if you answer no to all the questions, then it doesn't have to go to the ethics committee. If it goes to the ethics committee, somebody else will help you uh, and, and cover you that this has been thought about. And it is being it is being conducted in an ethical way, but it's just not a typical situation. Yeah, yeah, I have done ethics applications before, but uh, it, it's a bit tricky. That was more we we have yeah. we have a medical school doing our ethics uh, generally, so they have very different background and they're they're quite complicated. So they don't really match any teaching or social science situations. So they they come with very awkward things because it can't it's tr clinical trial experience driven. But all right. Uh, so and one in the social science has actually told me you don't need any ethics at all. So an so, ethics person. So it's it's a bit. I would like to I would like to reiterate my basic point, which is ethics is not a formality. I'm not trying to avoid it, and it has over the last twenty years, in my experience, improved the quality of research. Yeah. So yes, there are times where it's a little bit awkward. Okay. Well, 
that's about improving quality. So, sorry. Right. Yeah. And 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 I know there's that there's wise words from uh, Jay Golding in the in the chat there about uh, uh, erring on the uh, um, careful side. Um, but I, I think we're really going to have to wrap it up there. There were some questions, particularly one about statistics, which I think would be good to answer. So maybe we, we could answer that um, offline and uh, stick it in the um, materials that get uh, associated. Well, they get put on the website. Um, but I mean, could I just uh, ask everybody to show their appreciation for the speakers again? And thank you very much. And you can you can do the um, the reactions if you like. And I'm going to hand over to Michael to to wrap things up. Yeah, thank, thanks, Kevin. I, I think this is possibly a, a, a quick plug, if I may, for something that is, is, I think, very, very relevant to the conversations that we've just seen. Um, and it's something that Mark Hodds and I, are, uh, Mark is at Coventry, we're working on, that we're we're launching something we're calling Delta Prime as a, as a network, which is designed to kind of help colleagues who are looking to develop scholarly and pedagogic activity through collection of data and and, uh, and research. Uh, there's a lot of, of information there. Um, we, we are going to be kind of sharing things over various lists, but the whole idea is to kind of have a cross-institutional support program for any colleagues that, that are either experienced in this area, wanting to share their approaches, just as we've seen, you know, very generously with, with Kathy and Chris today, but also colleagues who are new and, and to help us unpick some of these issues around ethics, which, uh, you know, often have some very, very kind of localised uh, issues we need to explore. Uh, and this isn't just for kind of academic staff. This is students, researchers, practitioners um, across the board. And it's something Mark and I piloted a couple of years ago, uh, which worked really, really quite well. So if you're interested in this, um, then please do. Um, we've got a team site at the moment. We'll launch some more details. And I think following the announcement last week we've got some quite exciting plans uh, coming through so if you're interested do feel free to drop mark uh, an email to kind of sign up to the team site that could be a way as well of sort of sharing some information about the the institutional seminars um, but if you'd like your institution to become involved and i think it's it's great to say we've got cardiff uh, bristol leeds manchester nottingham and the open university joining birmingham uh, and Coventry so far. So again, if you're interested in being part of this network that doesn't replace anything locally, but just as a way of sort of sharing this, so we can we can join up across um, across the UK, but also potentially internationally, um, there's a sign up form there as well, which um, I'll pop into the chat in a in a minute. So just plug in that one, um, and I'll end it there as we end on three o'clock. I think from Kevin, Rachel, and I, I think it just remains to say. Thank you to Chris and Kathy once again for a, a sort of superb seminar that's got some real discussion going. Um, most importantly, hopefully everyone starts to break up shortly for a festive break. Uh, I know some colleagues have postponed that to, to, to join here today, um, but we've got some exciting plans for Talmo, which we'll pick up in the new year. But in the meantime, hope everyone has a fantastic holiday season uh, and a chance to rest and recuperate. And uh, from Rachel, Kevin and I, see you all in 2024.